God damn it. Thank you for the sub right off the bat. Woo! Lower that just a smidgy, would you? If I don't see any of the alerts and I don't thank you, then forgive me. Uh, somebody just give me a heads up in the chats. Uh, give me a second. I'm going to pop the chats out so I can read them on this computer, too. So I will be able to see you guys easier. So the first game we're doing tonight is Dagon, which is a visual novel. So this is Dagon, the Lovecraft story, of course. And I know it might be loud. I'm lowering my hand. There we go. That should be okay. So, go away. Go away. You guys don't see it. Don't worry. Go. There we go. Thank you. So let me know if this is too loud. Dagon is a faithful interactive adaption of H.V. Lovecraft's work focused on story and atmosphere. You will not find difficult choices, action sequences, or inventory management here. And movement is limited to progressing through the locations along with the plot. I am writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. During the game, you will encounter interactive elements. Some of them will allow you to continue in your journey. Others reveal interesting facts about the original short story, its historical background, and the author. Some of the trivia is hidden. In order to find these secrets, focus your eyes and look for the Elder Sign. You can also access and access all the found facts later. They will be available in the main menu. So as you guys well know, I am a huge fan of Lovecraft. In fact, I have Cthulhu to thank for being able to do some of the games I plan to do either tonight or next stream. Penniless, and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer, and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. There, okay, so somebody asked, so wait, there is Lovecraft and Lovecraftian. So, let me explain. H.P. Lovecraft was the writer. The word Lovecraftian comes out because of the way he wrote and the worlds he created. He basically caused an entire genre to exist, which was named after him. That's what Lovecraftian means. It's based off of his writings and the world he built, which even today, a lot of companies like to ride. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess, though never fully realize why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. Morphine. Morphine entered into use in the 19th century and was routinely administered to treat severe pain during the American Civil War, 1861-1865, and World War I, 1914-1918. It was also sold without restriction until 1914. Morphine became more popular after the innovation of the hydro... the... Uh, sorry hypodermic syringe around the eight, around 1854. Frederick Surturner, Surturner, hopefully I said that right, who probably didn't, whose first isolated the substance originally named it Morphium, after Morpheus, the Greek god associated with dreams. At the time when Dagon was published, morphine abuse, known as soldier's disease, already posed a big problem in the United States. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet of which I was supercargo fell a victim to the German Sea Raider. Hmm. 
nothing here. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degradation. So that our vessel was made a legitimate prize, whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. The Huns. The Huns were Central Asian nomads who established a dom a dominion in Europe and invaded the Roman Empire in the 5th century AD. They were known as brutal, deadly warriors and masters of quick raid who also developed powerful composite bows, lassos and early siege weapons. During World War I, the British used the word Hun as a synonym for Germans in order to emphasize their brutality. However, the term originated when the German Emperor Wilhelm II gave a speech to his troops on the 27th of July 1900 before they embarked to China. Should you encounter the enemy, he will be defeated. No quarter will be given. Prisoners will not be taken. Whoever falls into your hands is forfeited. Just as a thousand years ago, the Huns under their king, Attila, made a name for themselves, one that even today makes them seem mighty in history. And legend, may the name German be affirmed by you in such a way in China that no Chinese will ever again dare to look cross-eyed at a German. Ooh, hoo, hoo. a refusal to take prisoner was a clear breach of the laws and custom of war adopted during the first Hague Convention of 1899. Thank you for the sub, taxman. Seven months in a row. Oh, I haven't seen the movie in years. Now you remind me it exists. So liberal, indeed, was the discipline of our captors that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water and provisions for a good length of time. So we managed to get an escape. Nothing here for historical. It is nice how they're adding historical stuff to it. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Of the longitude, I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. So yeah, I'm not sure how much of this will do, but I do want to see how well they do this, because I did like the demo. The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. If you think you're going to have that happen to you, then good luck. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastness of unbroken blue. The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know. And it begins. For my slumber, though troubled and dream infested, was continuous. Squid! Aren't they cute? Mm, pretty sure that one's a crab back there. When at last I awoke, it was to discover myself half sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see, and in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished. 
for there was in the air and in the rotting soil a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. Oh hey, a couple of uh, octopus upside down. There was nothing within hearing and nothing in sight save a vast reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. Let's see if we can find anything. Well, it doesn't surprisingly look like there's anything here. Okay. Ooh, the sound effect. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing regions for which innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, straining my ears as I might. Nor were there any sea fowl to prey upon the dead things. There we go. Sorry, I forgot to mute my other computer. Aw. Really, you have the option to give me lots of things to clicky-click and listen to, but you don't. For several hours, I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. Looks like there's something up there. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for traveling purposes in a short time. That night I slept but little, and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. Okay. Well, it looks like something wants to say hi, doesn't it? On the third morning, I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil and set out boldly for an unknown goal. Uh, okay, here's a question, guys. Do you want to keep hearing the narration or do you guys want me to read the narration? I'm curious what you guys would like. Squid. Dead squid. Very dead squid. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. Well, that's a creature. We're just not even going to talk about those weird things? Okay. Don't try to explain them. We just, we're not even going to try to explain the weirdness. All right. That night, I encamped, and on the following day still traveled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first espied it. I don't say if I ever plan to do any games. I just do whatever I do. Oh. The horrors of the ocean, the creator of the Cthulhu mythos and the fictional underwater city of Relech, 
was convinced that life could not exist at the bottom of the ocean because the water's pressure would make it uninhabitable. Today we know that the darkest depths of the ocean are home to many peculiar organisms. The deepest swelling fish we have discovered so far, the marina, the Mar Mariana snailfish, can live about 8,000 meters, more than 26,000 feet below the ocean surface, in never-ending darkness and at a hellish crushing pressure. Hundreds of times stronger than those found at sea level. Upon glancing at the modern photos of the deep sea creatures, such as the anglerfish, the fangtooth, or the viperfish, and their truly Lovecraftian characteristics, it's not it's hard not to find some irony in this. By the fourth evening, I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance. For those joining us, this is Dagon. This is an exact visual novel of the original story. An intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night, but ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain. I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again, and in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Yes, I believe I did pick it up. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. Let's see if there's anything to look around here at. Nope. So we're going to head up the I have mount. said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me. But I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon. Not yet. Whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illumine. I felt myself on the edge of the world. Peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. I kind of hope we get him, uh, what is it? Tamadachi life or another one of them on the switch. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of Paradise Lost and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. Nothing for us to look at? Nope. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent. Whilst after a drop of only a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. Well, we're going down, everybody. Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze, I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath. Hopefully I plan on playing Bandit at 3. Not too thrilled with them changing the voice, but eh. No, I don't play Splatoon. Gazing into the Stygian deeps, where no light had yet penetrated. All at once, my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me. An object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. Well, this can only end well in a Lovecraft story. Let's 
Nothing, really? Okay. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself. But I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. No, really? A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express. And we're still going to walk over to it. For despite its enormous magnitude, and its position in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith, whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. I... let's... let's go for a bad idea, everyone. The moon, now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm, and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. Oh, I am testing something with ads, so sorry if you guys get one. I set it for like every 28 to 30 minutes. But if you're, you're sub, you know, you don't get one. But don't sub because of that. I'm just letting you guys know I was testing some automatic thing. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me and unlike anything I'd ever seen in books. I don't know. I recognize shark, turtle, hammerhead, other shark. You know, I'm not going to keep this Consisting right for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Welcome, Jordan. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean-risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound. Boy, doesn't that look familiar. Storytelling methods. Dagon contains many themes and storytelling methods that Lovecraft developed in his later works, such as telling the story through carvings at the Mountains of Madness, the Nameless City, Journals and Character Notes, The Shadow Out of Time, The Hunter of the Dark, Islands Emerging from the Ocean, The Call of Cthulhu, or Cthulhu, if you'd rather, or Fictional Beings and Deities Based on Real Events and Mythology, Migo in the Whispers in Darkness. It also considered the orig origin of the popular Cthulhu mythos. Some of Lovecraft's other stories also concluded in a manner similar to Dagon. But let's skip the detail in order not to spoil the ending. Plainly visible across the intervening water, on account of their enormous size, were an array of bas-reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of a Doré. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men. Though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in the waters of some marine grotto, or paying homage at some monolithic shrine which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail, for the mere remembrance makes me grow faint. Grotesque beyond the imagination of a Poe or a Bulwer. They were damnably human in general outline, 
despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background. For one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented as but little larger than himself. Ooh, I wonder who that is. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe. Some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. I should have grabbed myself a drink. You made me thirsty, darn it, Zio. I'll grab one after this. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist. I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. So, let's play a little bonus game with the chat. Back when Lovecraft was writing, what did the word queer mean? I'm curious to see how many people know it. Also, thank you. I'm glad you like the avatar changes. But the word has changed since that time. We've got Tenji, Flaming, and Bear Hermit who got it. And King. Yes. And Bloody. Can mean strange, weird, unusual. And that's basically what it originally meant. I'm not meaning it as offensive. Shadow Wolf. That's actually what the original word meant. What does dude mean? Dude? My dude? Then, suddenly, I saw it. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Last, polyphemus-like and loathsome, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. Uh-oh. I think I went mad then. Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. Oh, poor Jordan, are you sick? We need to get out of here. I believe I sang a great deal and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. And madness takes its hold. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm sometime after I reach the boat. At any rate, I know that I heard pearls of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest moods. This is actually a visual novel. Welcome. We're uh, playing Dagon. When I came out of the shadows, I was in a San Francisco hospital. Brought thither by the captain of the American ship which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium, I had said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. Oh, please, I welcome everybody's friends to come watch and enjoy. Oh, thank you. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing. Nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. Everyone's always welcome. The Journalist Lovecraft was a prominent figure in the world of amateur journalism, 
In 1915, he started publishing his own journal called The Conservative, which included political and social commentary, poetry, short stories, and literature criticism written by him and other authors. Howard was a skilled wordsmith, but he also took criticism to heart, which resulted in his decision to step away from writing poetry and concentrate on weird fiction again. For the first time since his teenage years, Dagon, published in 1917, is one of the story, short stories written during that period. In this example, excerpts from The Conservative, the master of horror's fiction explained his attitude towards warfare and the idea of world peace. Why any sane human being can believe in the possibility of universal peace is more than the conservative can fathom. Should the entire civilized world agree simultaneously to disarm one or more nations would undoubtedly retain secret armaments and, at the proper time, take advantage of their more illustrious and less astute contemporaries in a wild career of conquest against unarmed victims. No country is, or ever can be, above warfare until the basic impulse of the human animal shall have miraculously changed. All, yeah, it's all, sorry, it's, it's all tister, it's all ter, ter, alterist, alteristic. There are certain words I cannot say. Shut it. And I also do agree with Lovecraft, yes. There is no way we would ever have true world peace. And also, even if we did, it would be completely boring. Why would you want a world with no kind of excitement in it? There are words. English is hard, yes. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. World peace is boring. I, I agree I don't believe world peace could happen because mankind inherently wants to fight each other. We are always looking for some kind of argument, even if small, so I don't think it's possible. Dagon. Dagon, or Dagan, was the main deity of the Philistines worshipped throughout the Middle East as the ancient god of fertility and crops. In Hebrew, the word Dagon was a common noun for ga grain. The rulers of Akkad, not that one chat, Mesopotamia chose him as the patron saint of their war conquests. He also appeared as the judge of the dead in an Assyrian poem and an underworld prison warded in one of the Babylonian texts. He is often mistakenly taken for his fish god, for a fish god, due to the wrong interpretation of his name, as in Hebrew, the word dag means fish. In H.P. Lovecraft's works, Dagon or Dagon is an underwater deity ruling over the deep ones, a humanoid race with fish traits that reside in the oceans. He is worshipped by a secret cult called the es Esoteric Order of Dagon, or Dagon. Let's see. Oh, I'm sure somebody will get mad about my views on world peace and things like that, but I'm fine with it. But soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries.
August Duluth and the Cthulhu Mythos. August Duluth was an American writer and an anthologist. He also befriended Lovecraft and published many of his works through his company, Arkham House. Although he greatly contributed to the popul popul popular sorry popularized popularization sorry of the author's work after his death he is surrounded by numerous controversies one of his most questionable decisions involved introducing the good versus evil doctrine Deleuth was a devout Catholic to the Cthulhu mythos which contrasted with Lovecraft's view of the world and his approach to cosmic horror as a result the author's works are often misunderstood and misinterpreted in today's culture. It is also worth noting that Lovecraft was never really interested in creating a mythology, and the term Cthulhu Mythos was coined by Deleuth after the author left the mortal plane. You know, it is true. A lot of people actually believe that the gods of Lovecraft and the stories have good and evil in them. And they really don't. The whole thing with Lovecraft and the Cthulhu mythos in general is... Well, if you guys haven't read the stories, read them. You're gonna see chaos and madness, and that's about it. Good and evil aren't really a thing. Because honestly, who really needs them everywhere? Yeah, they were introduced later as this explains, but it is something that I've always thought weird, because when I read them, I never really saw a good guy or a bad guy. But a lot of my friends did, and I never really understood why they did. But as one of them once told me, you have to have a villain, you have to have a good guy, which I don't agree with. Exactly, as Flaming says, there is no side... That's actually why, if you've seen the newer Call of Cthulhu game, which I really love, I need to pick up a physical copy of the Switch game, um, a lot of people didn't like the ending of the game because there was no winning it, quote-unquote. And that's the whole thing. It's Lovecraft. You're not going to win if you're the human. Just remember that. There's no happy ending for you. Nonsense. I have a Cthulhu statue right above my computer area. Let's see. Can we find any secrets? So yeah, I'm kind of a big fan of, of um, Lovecraft stories and of Lovecraft himself. Um, my boyfriend actually did a very, very good video about H.P. Lovecraft, if you haven't seen it. Weaponized Nerd Rage, just look him up. He did a fantastic video that I actually helped with. So um, it, it's really, really worth a watch. It is very, very good. I'm going to do a live reading of Call of Cthulhu, maybe for It is home? at night, I'm not sure. especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease, and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now, I am to end it all, having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Lovecraft on tobacco and alcohol. Lovecraft hated tobacco, even though he used to smoke when he was 12 in order to look and feel like an adult. In his correspondence with friend Reinhardt Kleiner, Kleiner, he claims that he quit as soon as he started wearing long pants. He also had a very strong opinion about alcohol as evidenced by his letter to Zelia Brown, dated 13th February 1928. As for the matter of drinking, I have never tasted intoxicating liquor, and never intend to. 
having a strong aesthetic disgust at anything which blunts or coarsen or coarsens the delight natural equipos I have fuck you I don't know that word of the evolved human intellect and imagination drinking excite, excited my personal rep repunge hence I don't drink let the herd do what they will I am rather in favor of prohibition the prohibition of any one antisocial force as well as any other source the spirit of revision lovecraft's letters to zalia brown reed bishop h.p lovecraft sean brainery and andrew lehman i am not going to be able to pronounce that don't even try he loved cats Everyone's gonna bring up the cat that wasn't even his. Which makes it always funnier. Man, that cat could have had a much worse name. Let's face it, it could have Often, had a much worse name. I ask myself if it could not all have been a pure phantasm. Thank you. Good night, Dark Brony, and thanks for stopping by. A mere freak of fever as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man of war. How does such a standard man write crazy horror? I mean, I don't drink and I write horror. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed. Worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite, I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down into their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind. Of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. I, yeah, I'd rather write sober than drunk. The end is near. I hear a noise at the door as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. It's coming. It shall not find me. Hemingway, am I a joke to you? <laughs> I don't know. Ask the boom boom stick. I'm sorry, that one was really bad taste. God, that hand! The window! The window! It's his landlord. I need that or my landlord. Thank you for playing. We hope you enjoyed. Immersing yourself in our little pool of cosmic horror. We would appreciate it if you took a moment to rate Dagon and check out our other game and DLC. So there are two DLC to this, and I may end up looking them up and trying them. I really did enjoy this, and if you guys really like this, I'll do more. So that was Dagon, which is out right now on Steam. I want to thank the developers, of course, for sending it to me. And we're going to go from... You guys get a choice. Should we look for another cosmic horror? Or should we go a little, you know, child-friendly? If everyone got a little too scared, we can go a little child-friendly. It's okay. We can do it. It's okay. You can admit if you're a little afraid. 